hand over to Terry. Over to you, Terry. Thank you, Brett. Thanks. A um, little bit of uh, background on me. Uh, for those who may not know me, I had the unique honour to be the first chair of uh, EBCU, uh, something I'm still very proud of. Um, this uh, podcast we're doing tonight came about partly as a result of a little conversation Brett and myself had last year over a few beers, uh, best way to have conversations. And we talked about looking at beer styles, the uniqueness of what makes countries special, and more pointantly, what makes Europe so special in terms of beer. So <clears throat> the end result was we created uh, a concept called a continent of beer, which is some of Europe better, I think. Uh, and as we will go on over the next year, two years or whatever, we will have a series of uh, one-off uh, discussions on specific countries, talking about their tourism, how to uh, appreciate, enjoy, and uh, not give a wrong impression about beer drinkers when you're in their countries. But tonight we thought we need to set the scene uh, about what is it so special about Europe? Why is Europe so special in terms of uh, beer? Beer is worldwide, but Europe uh, certainly wasn't the founder, but has that unique distinction. So a history of European beer, uh, some thoughts and delights, and possibly a few groans as well, uh, and maybe a look to the future. Um, couldn't find anyone better to do it than Mr. Webb, Dr. Webb, who uh, is uh, one of the most knowledgeable people I know around about European beer. So without further ado, I'm going to hand you over to Tim and let Tim uh, run you through for the next 40, 45 minutes or so. OK, thanks very much, Terry. Um, I take it I have successfully unmuted myself, though the button's disappeared. Uh, yes, you have. Yes. OK, I'm Tim Webb. I write books about beer. I used to write The Good Beer Guide Belgium about eight editions. I've done three editions of the World Atlas of Beer to date. I've been part of uh, European Beer Consumers Union for about the last eight years, serving on the executive and more recently uh, ha having an interest in our publishing and publications. What I'm intending to do <clears throat> is talk for however long this talk lasts, because I haven't actually timed it, um, it should be hopefully 30 to 40 minutes, then we'll take it. I'm, I'm happy to take any questions there are. If you want to put them into the chat at the side of the screen, then Terry will harvest those and we'll start with those questions. Um, I'm proud to introduce this series uh, of talks about beer in Europe. Um, our aim is really to try to orientate the listener, the viewer, to uh, why Europe has such a special place in the world of beer and um i need to say i Lord. think that we're living at the moment through a time of almost non-stop excitement when uh, all the news events certainly in this country are contain the words unprecedented to describe things that are happening this series i hope will be the opposite it's not intended to whip you up into a frenzy it's not intended to be groundbreaking. It's more uh, intended to be grounding, to just sort of take stock of what we've got here. And if we've done our job properly, by the end of it, you will become a dedicated beer tourist. So let's just start with the proposition. Um, from the historical perspective, Europe cannot claim to be the birthplace of beer. That was, uh, it depends on your definitions, but the first recording of uh, alcoholic beverages being made by fermenting grain comes from Hunan, China, Hunan province in China. It's a mountainous area about 200, 300 kilometers north of Hong Kong, Macau. It's actually the birthplace of Chairman Mao. And uh, residual fragments on pottery, bits of pottery there from 9,000 BC, uh, 11,000 years ago, show evidence of fermented grain 
or fermented fruit and rice, to be accurate. Um, we know that a couple of millennia later, they were brewing something that was recognizably a beer in the Fertile Crescent around Mesopotamia, modern Iraq. Uh, the grain that was used then was stuff called emma. And experimentation with uh, brewing with emma and other types of ancient grain in recent years suggests that they were probably brewing with emma because it gave a much more substantial flavor than other grains that were around at the time. This gets modified by the ancient Egyptians, um, or more accurately, we have evidence that uh, by the time of the ancient Egyptians, a crude form of malting uh, barley was their prefer was certainly a preferred method of making their equivalent of beer. Uh, the malting process just involves soaking grains of barley uh, and then bringing them out of the water and letting them germinate. It wasn't anything sophisticated. We don't quite know how they made their beer. There's some suggestions that it was uh, fermented barley breadcrumbs that was uh, actually being being brewed. By the time of the ancient Greeks, barley was still being used, so was wheat. They also brewed with honey. And we know that beer had become a popular drink, particularly in the army and among laborers. The Celts, the first time we were properly into mainstream Europe, Celtic brewing had begun by two and a half thousand years ago. The Greek historian Herodotus actually made a note uh, in the 5th century BC uh, that the Celts were clearly lovers of alcohol. Uh, some things never change. Uh, the, the, um, the evidence of brewing came from France, but it's dated two and a half thousand years ago. If you look Far to the present day, then Europe can't really claim to be leading the dynamism of what I call not the brewing revolution, but the brewing counter-revolution. If you want to look at the really exciting things that have been happening in the third uh, Christian millennium since 2000, you need to look to the USA. And because my oldest daughter is now a Canadian citizen and my writing partner is a Canadian citizen, I have to say all of North America, because Canada has been the sobering influence. Um, Nowadays, possibly, you can argue that it's not so much North America that's leading the chase. It is Latin America where there's some extraordinary things happening in the world of beer. But actually, beer, craft beer, craft brewing, high quality brewing, small scale brewing uh, is happening all over the world now, uh, all, all over the non-Muslim world. So Europe's time is really between, it's, it's, it's really the second Christian millennium. It's between around 1000 and 2000 AD. And Europe's claim to uh, have contributed massively to uh, the beer world. I think uh, you can sum it up as saying Europe took beer when it was a rough dietary staple and over about a thousand years, it shaped it into a worldwide commercial commodity. Uh, that at its height was making up, well, it still is at its height, kind of, uh, was making up about 4% of the global economy. And beer is and remains uh, the world's most popular alcoholic beverage. So if we look at what Europe did, uh, what were its major contributions? And I, I like simple ideas. And for me, the simple idea is that uh, Europe did the legwork on three major contributions to beer, two of which were deliberate, one of which was incidental. And the first of the deliberate ones was that beer brought, I'm uh, sorry, Europe brought hops to beer. Uh, this, was, this was not a speedy revolution. This was a very slow revolution. The, the first evidence of uh, hops being cultivated is from the end of the eighth century in Bohemia. Uh, there is evidence of active cultivation of hops rather than simply harvesting wild hops. 
but there's no evidence around to say what they were used for. You can assume they were used in brewing, but that's an assumption, that's not a definite. The first definite link of uh, hops to beer came from uh, an abbot or an abbey near Amiens in France, who uh, late in the ninth century happens to mention that 10% uh, of the abbey's grain was given to the abbey's porter, who I think uh, you can say is the guy, guy in charge of running practical things for the abbot. Um, and he also had to have 10% of the wild hops so that he could make enough beer. That's the first definite link between uh, grain, hops, and beer that has been recorded. By the 11th century, we start getting some more cynical evidence of brewing in that one of the King Wenceslas of Bohemia uh, effectively taxed hops. So we can assume that they were quite a hot commodity by then. Taxing a useful herb wasn't unusual. Uh, rosemary and bog myrtle, which also happened to be to feature in the uh, spice mixes that preceded hops as a standard ingredient of beer, groot as it's called in um, in Dutch, gruy in French, grut in English, lovely English. The um, but hops were being uh, taxed. Hops were also being used. Uh, as an acceptable payment when you were paying your taxes. And the third piece of slightly cynical evidence is that hops also started to become taxed if exported. Uh, so there's reason to believe that a hop trade was well established by then. We know because of the uh, earliest organized communal breweries that also came from Bohemia that they were using hops in brewing. And it's not unreasonable to suggest that uh, the principal use of hops was, was by then already uh, in the making of beer. Nonetheless, it took about 500 years to go from uh, the regional use of hops in beer in Bohemia to the general acceptance of hops as a main, uh, as a ingredient of all mainstream beers in Europe. There were wars in Flanders, uh, effectively over the loss of power that the Groot merchants had, um, because they were selling uh, a product that, well, the, the ideal product was something that could slow down the speed at which beer started to oxidize and go off. And Groot was a, was big business because it was, it was, it was. Uh, the thing that brewers could use allegedly to stop their beer going off. I think it's probably more likely that it, it stopped it smelling and tasting as if it had gone off. It has actually gone off, but they were putting quite flavoursome herbs and spices in to 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 um, to mask that. Either way, uh, hops got a really bad press in Flanders, as they did in the UK 100, 150 years later, after the Flemish hop growers had exported their trade to Kent in England, and the English or the British uh, were probably the last European nation to take up hops as an essential mainstream ingredient of beer, uh, though by the probably the third quarter of the 16th century, even the British had caught up with the rest of Europe. Where have you heard that before? Uh, <clears throat> so. By this stage, um, if you're looking at it from my premise that Europe did all the heavy lifting to create beer as we know it today, that's the point at which European beer becomes different from the grain drinks that are probably in existence in other parts of the world. Beer was a hop containing uh, beverage, alcoholic beverage, largely made from barley or wheat, some oats brewing happening. Um, I think it was in Denmark, oat brewing. Oat, brewing with oats was really prominent until the middle of the 19th century. Why did hops win through? Now, this, I think, is an interesting one. And you, it's kind of put about, but mainly by people in the hop trade, that people came to like the flavor of hops in their beer. I, I'm pretty certain that that will, is likely to be a secondary 
thing. Uh, it is far more likely that the real impact that hops made was because of get, they got they got in the way of oxidation, um, and they were in some ways antiseptic as well. And the impact of taking a session strength beer, and remember that back then, in terms of bulk, the largest part of beer was probably a two percent, three percent alcohol, second runnings thing there to quench thirst and not give people cholera uh, or other gastrointestinal infections. Um, but to take the shelf life of that sort of beer from being two or three days before it turned to being probably two or three weeks, that was a big thing. And, and, and there was an even bigger impact with beers that were brewed to be much stronger because if you loaded them with hops and you put them into oak casks, which was a standard container for all sorts of foodstuffs and oils and all sorts of liquids um, and you could actually keep them in better condition for anything up to two three years that made a massive impact on what the product was and this is my theory and I've never I say it's my theory but nobody's ever taken it seriously only me um, but but I, I, I'm sure it's right there there's an interesting sequence of events that happens before the 16th century, there were a few brewers' guilds, just like there were guilds of other craftsmen. But they tended to be limited to large cities, such as London, where, if you think about it, if you've got a product with a life expectancy of 48 hours, then you may just about get a trade in it, um, simply because of the volume of people who are there who you can sell it to. Uh, Fast-moving consumer goods, 13th century style. The... Uh, when you've got something that you've got longer to sell, you start to get a tradable commodity on a much larger scale. Now, when guilds formed in medieval times, guilds were almost invariably run by men. On the other hand, uh, ale production had, in many countries, tended to be either a domestic pursuit or one that was organized on, on a small commercial scale by the women of the village, the town, et cetera. So, so my proposition is that hops were responsible for uh, brewing, going away from being the arena of the alewives <laughs> and other um, uh, female groups of brewers to being a male trade. Uh, and that came along with uh, it, right, that, 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 well, that got them even the more so as, as brewing became more urbanized. Moving on to the second deliberate thing that Europe did for beer, uh, it's the mastery of yeast. Now, yeast is another one of these things that took about seven or eight centuries to go from being recognized as a thing to going through being the subject of various beliefs to a much more complete understanding. Even since ancient times, uh, civilizations had been using fermentation and uh, microbiological activity to do things to food and drink. They, it wasn't simply to create alcohol from anything with sugar in it. It's also to enhance tastes. If you think about um, cheeses and things like that, for example, flavor enhancement, using microbiological microbiological action and also some pretty basic times of uh, basic sorts of preservation the most obvious one of which is turning milk products into yogurt now the thing was however that although ancient civilizations knew how to do this they didn't actually know what they were doing how it occurred uh, that became almost an obsession of uh, monastic scholars because uh, certainly in regard to the fermentation of sugar into alcohol, uh, this was seen as a positive sign that God was good and God loves us. And even the estimable Hildegard von Bingen, uh, the abbess of the abbey at Bingen, who, who actually got into anything, uh, anything intellectual, Hildegard's done stuff on it. And she, was, uh, she put quite a lot of time into considering what was happening in the process of fermentation. It wasn't actually till 1680 when another European, a uh, Dutch nationalist, a uh, Dutch nationalist, 
Dutch naturalist uh, called Anton von Leeuwenhoek uh, actually got to see yeast under a microscope for the first time. But he thought they were just globules of stuff. He didn't um, consider that they might be live organisms. It took another 150 years for that realization. And it was a German physician, Theodor Schwann, uh, who did, did quite a few things in his career. He's, he's, uh, he's got cells in the brain named after him. So, so you can tell he's a, he's a cool guy. Um, but one of the things he did was that he, he, he uh, declared that yeast was either algae or, or fungi, but either way, it was a live thing. And that's what Pasteur worked on 30 years later. And between about 1857 and 1865, Louis Pasteur becomes the father of microbiology. He uh, solves quite a lot of the conundrums about what, um, what is happening in the fermentation process and also what's happening in the, the beer spoiling process. He worked more on wine than beer, but, but it was, uh, what he did was very relevant to beer. And you might also include people like Emil Christian Hansen at the Carlsberg Brewery. Uh, in the early 1980, early 1880s, who first perfected um, a lager yeast that could be used on a large commercial scale and come up with consistent results again and again. What did yeast? What did the understanding of yeast bring to beer? Well, uh, it's difficult to put things down purely and simply the yeast because parallel with the yeast thing. Uh, and a half European invention, half American, was large scale re re refrigeration. And the mid 1800s saw uh, these two developments, understanding the good side and the bad side of what yeast could do at the same time, for the first time, being able to control temperature and even control it at a really low temperature. And that advanced the technical many technical parts of brewing hugely mm -hmm. um the uh and i think it, it to put it in its simplest it enabled brewers for the first time to experiment with different types of beer uh, which they'd always done but to experiment with different types of beer different methods different ways of keeping stuff good different ways of of developing flavors uh subtly different for lagers and ales uh, and being in more control. So, and this this kind of leads into the third thing that I think Europe did for beer. And this was the unintentional one. I don't think it was planned. But Europe created massive diversity in the nature of beer. Far greater diversity than one sees in the world of wine. Um, and it's kind of always been there. And it's always been there because... There was no single thread to uh, European brewing. Uh, for example, porter and stout were very British, Irish, uh, anyway, British invention, Irish development, or British and Irish development, um, but very much associated with the, with the British Isles. Uh, on the other hand, Keller beers, and which, which really begat the uh, lagered beers, were very much Central European in origin. There, there was a wheat beer diaspora across Central and Western Europe, where you can see different styles of wheat beer flourishing in different, made in different ways, probably having different flavors, but spreading across uh, modern day Austria, Czech Republic, uh, Germany, Poland, into Belgium, Southern Netherlands, uh, probably across into France. Then in the north, in northern Europe, you had a completely different tradition that might be related to Celtic brewing. There was the tradition of farmhouse ales uh, and, and beers brewed from other grains. Uh, we had an excellent talk last year from Lars Marius Gosel on uh, the yeasts that um, developed, uh, that have developed in Scandinavia to make these beers. But they were essentially farmhouse beers uh, with with not so much wild yeast as um, complicated and out of control yeast, I think is, is the way I like to look at it. And, and another fact, a final factor in this lack of a common thread, is that although this is 
bizarre for us nowadays, certain technologies were really slow uh, to move from one country to another. Uh, my favorite example is uh, the the smoked beers. Uh, in, in the UK, where when the Coke ovens were in, invented in the 16th century, uh, very swiftly they were applied to malting. And it's likely that by the early 17th century, British beers had stopped being like all other beers in that they weren't heavily smoked and they weren't necessarily even as burnt as, uh, uh, as uh, well, the malts weren't as burnt as elsewhere. Pale ales started to be made in the UK in the 17th century. That, that technology took until about the eight, uh, early 1800s to get into Central Europe. Um, and it was, I think it was Gabriel Zedemeyer Sr. Is, is thought to have introduced the Coke oven into maltings in Germany for the first time and uh, created unsmoked beer. Uh, so very different ways of developing beer in different regions of Europe, different countries of Europe. The other factor that played into this diversity is that there wasn't actually any need for uniformity of beer across the continent. Uh, in fact, quite the opposite. Colder countries often felt they had a need for stronger beers. On the other hand, hotter countries in the south of Europe uh, were perfectly happy to get to, to, to get, get by with lighter beers just because of the need for greater hydration. There's also a technical issue. Water, water is different around different parts, well, everywhere. Uh, and often beers developed to fit the water supply they had. I'm not thinking that uh, in the days before inorganic chemistry and water supplies was understood, I doubt very much that this was something that was worked out by anything other than trial and error, but it still led to different styles of beer being available in different places. One thing for us in the, in the modern era to get our heads around is that um, there's, I, I attended a wonderful talk um, by the guy whose name has just gone out of my head. Um, the guy behind, uh, well, Adel uh, Kaiser, Mr. Kaiser, uh, whose theory is that craft beer was a product of the internet. And uh, he may well be right. He's certainly right in, in, in Michael Kaiser. And the, uh, he's right in one way in that nowadays, if something is invented on a Monday and a new type of beer comes out on a Monday, you can bet your life by Wednesday, somebody's imitating it. Uh, there, this, this spread of knowledge, instant spread of knowledge, knowledge being spread without the benefit of experience um, is something we've learned to live with. And we've learned that everybody in all parts of the world can try and make everybody else's sorts of beer, etc. That's not how it worked 200 years ago. And these spreads of styles were much, much, much slower if they happened at all. And and again, this is this is a Tim Webb theory, and but it's one that I it's another one I quite like, uh, which is that for, for, for me a beer style, is, is, there's two things to beer styles. The first is that all that a beer style is, is it's an informal agreement between a brewer and a customer, usually expressed through a name on a label by which the first tells the second roughly what sort of beer they're going to buy. Um, the other thing about beer styles, and this is, this is, I think is socially very important. I think beer style, a lot of beer styles developed because there was another informal agreement, which was that a brewer or brewers in a certain area started to make this type of beer because they were good at it, because the local ingredients worked that way, because the water supply worked that way. And the customers accepted it or did not accept it. And so I think a lot of beer styles emerged by an informal agreement between producers and consumers as to what kind of stuff we're going to drink around here. Uh, and I do question seriously whether that is beer's equivalent of terroir uh, in wine. Anyway. So beer's development was random, it was disorganized, it was sporadic, it was uncoordinated. There is not much evidence that it was that joined up until the 19th century, late 19th century. It was also inefficient, but on the whole, 
uh, I think Europe did a good job. So where are we now? Uh, where we are now is Europe is the world's largest beer souvenir shop. And it's out there to be explored. And at this point, I apologize to anybody who's heard this story before. I've, I've, I've put it in print a couple of times over the years. But I have to mention Elmer and Marjorie. And this was a cold February Sunday morning in 1993, just before my second daughter was born. And I lived in a village in Suffolk. And on a Sunday morning, I would go to the butcher's shop. And this being Suffolk, the butcher's shop did not sell meat on a Sunday morning. It was that Mrs. Basham, the butcher's wife, wanted to sell Sunday papers. And so I'm going to get a Sunday paper. I'm walking down the lane. I get to the village green. I'm crossing over it. And there, hanging off the door of the bright red telephone kiosk on Hartest Village Green, was a elderly man in a baseball cap, uh, a very loud short sleeve shirt, Bermuda shorts and plimsolls, smiling at the camera being held by his wife, who was much more sensibly dressed in long baggy trousers, a puffed out jacket, a hat. She'd had to take her mittens off to do the pictures. And I'm British and it's Sunday. So I just sort of say, good morning and walk past. And I get my paper, but on the way back, uh, the guy is getting into more sensible clothes. And I think, all right, this won't be too risky. And this is quite amusing. Let, let's just see what's going on here. And it turns out he's American. Uh, they're both American, husband and wife. And he's called Elmer. And I've never met anybody before or since called Elmer, but he was called Elmer. And they explained, because I asked them, you know, what are you doing on Village Green in this tiny village, middle of nowhere? And they explained that when Elmer retired from AT&T Telecoms uh, at the end of the previous year, he had the, he and his wife had wanted to travel. But they looked at how you travel. They wanted to go to Europe. They looked at how you do this. And, and, and the, the two main options were either join a tour group, which both of them thought was absolutely appalling idea uh, to go around with strangers, trying to pretend you like them, and trying to swap anecdotes with them, find something. Oh, no, no, no. This was not for Elmer and Marjorie. And the alternative was to go to Hilton hotels in all the large cities of Europe and spend a lot of money going being in the same place every night. Uh, and that didn't appeal either way. Otherwise, uh, well, otherwise, well, you know what I mean. Um, and then Marjorie came up with a brainwave. She said, Elmer, what's been your hobby for the last 30 years? Well, it was collecting telecoms memorabilia and understanding telecoms history. So Marjorie said, why don't we go to Europe? And we'll go to all these places that were important in the development of the telecoms industry. And we'll we'll travel that way. We'll go from place to place where you want to see something. Fantastic idea. And I thought it was amazing. And we got into quite a long conversation. I gave them tips about a couple of places to go uh, and then wished them well. But I thought, this is the, oh, yeah, I should just explain. The reason he was hanging up. The telephone kiosk on Hartest Village Green was one of only three left in rural England that were the original version two design by Sir Giles Gilbert Scott, inventor of the iconic British telephone kiosk. And he'd been to the other two and Hartest was the final one. Anyway, I thought about this and I thought, he travels with telecoms history. Why don't I travel with beer? And that's what I've been doing for about 40 years, thanks to Elmer and Marjorie. And if I was setting out fresh now, uh, what would I recommend? Well, we're going to have talks about all of these places, so I'm just going to whistle through this. I'd recommend the UK. Uh, I have to say because of Cascale and the British pub, and I have to add, while they're still there, they're, they're both in a dreadful way, but they're a lengthy institution. Uh, Cascale is almost unique to the UK. There are other countries who do it now, but it's it's definitely of UK origin. I go to Traquair House in Scotland, uh, which for me is the uh, it's the original craft brewery because it was set up in the outhouse of a huge ancient country house uh, in Scotland that is of itself beautiful and where you can actually stay if you book far enough in advance. Uh, and it was set up to make Scotch ale, a type of beer that had virtually disappeared. 
Uh, and for me, that is, it is the spirit of the first craft brewery to make a daft type of ale that just happens to taste nice uh, in a dedicated brewery. Uh, and then I'd also go to the Blue Anchor pub in Helston in Cornwall for two reasons. First of all, it's one of the oldest brew pubs in the UK, uh, in, in Europe. Uh, it's been going on and off since uh, 16th century. It's been going continuously since about 1740. Uh, you go there also because of the regulars who are Cornish and rude and banter. And the third reason you go is it's as far from Queer House as it's possible to get on the UK mainland. So you have to see a lot of the UK in between and go to a lot of pubs. I'd go to Ireland, but I'm not going to say anything about Ireland because the remarkable John Duffy will be doing that talk, I think the first talk in this series. And he knows as much about Irish beer and brewing as the rest of humanity puts to, put together. Um, all I'd say about Ireland is that to point out that although Porter was invented in London and it was the world's first rock star beer style, it went all over the world. Predated pale ale for that, predated lager. Um, it was the Irish who, close by to where it was uh, invented, invented their own streams of Porter and Stout. And I'm delighted to say that the craft brewers are starting to pick those up and run with them as well. I'd go to Belgium because why not? Um, if there's anybody on this uh, call that's um, not been to Belgium to drink beer, just do it. Uh, whatever you're planning to do the week after next, just go and do it. <clears throat> Belgium was responsible for keeping beer diversity alive um, at a time when the whole of the world was trying to make brilliant, see-through, frothy-topped, low-hopped um, lagers. Belgium was still making... 60, 70, 80, 100 different types of local beer in particular styles. Um, it's now doing much better than it was back in the 1970s, but it, if Belgium hadn't been there, Lord knows what would have happened with craft beer and the future of beer generally. Also, the Belgians are masters of cafe design. And it is possible to go to Belgium, just go to one city, move, do your research, move from one bar to another. In a city of any decent size, there's bound to be at least half a dozen top-rate beer bars, each of which will have 100-plus beers. You, you, you won't have the same beer twice unless you choose to. Um, and you can just sit yourself there and steep yourself in the world's greatest beer culture. I go to the Netherlands for completely different reasons. It's on the northern border of uh, Belgium. But the Dutch, for me, the Dutch finesse, but better than anywhere, is that they're able to monetize beer trends and therefore take them forward quite rapidly, far better than any uh, other European nation. They did it with Heineken and Orangi Boom, which is now part of AB InBev, and the large-scale industrial lager makers. But they also did it with Belgian beer. They were the first to import Belgian beer in large amounts and, and did, carried on doing it well. And now they're doing it with their own craft beers. They're also very good at cafes. I go to Germany because Germany has a lengthy obsession with doing beer right. Uh, it tries to preserve regional specialties. Um, I would go to Germany, however, and do the special bits, Upper Franconia with its huge cluster of traditional breweries that have been around for a couple of hundred years, and also to Eastern Bavaria, where you have the Zeugel tradition, very similar to the communal beer houses of Bohemia, probably a thousand years ago, where beer is brewed at the brew house and then sent out to different merchants who will then um, ferment and condition it. Uh, and the same brew ends up tasting very different in lots of <laughs> small small places around. I'm aware I'm running out of um, time, so I'm, I'm just going to say that I'd also start, I try to understand lager uh, and how it came from the Calabria tradition. Uh, and I do that by spending time in Bavaria, Bohemia, and Austria, where you'll also see the concept of the grand scale brew pub with a massive restaurant and possibly uh, a small hotel next to it. Don't forget Poland. Poland is the capital of black beer diversity. And uh, I, I went to Wroclaw uh, a couple of years ago. I think I had 15 or 16 completely different styles of stout and porter. And they're also pretty good at smoked beers. It's not just Grodzisk. And yes, I take in Scandinavia for the folk beers and the beers of different grains. 
I take in Scandinavia for the beers that defy taxation. Um, huge, huge, strong beers uh, at, at, at remarkably high prices because of the taxation, but nonetheless made excellent enough to be worth it. And also to take a close look at their wonderful organized off trade uh, and the, the very simple. And I get to Iceland to see a beer culture that has no big brewery influence. When you've got into all those expert long-standing beer countries, I would thoroughly recommend going to uh, France, Italy, Spain, and Greece, because although they are not necessarily, France is to some extent building on old beer traditions, uh, but to a significant extent, the craft beer industries there are riffing on everything that comes along. And you can end up traveling beer in France, Italy, Spain, and Greece, simply by going from tap house to tap house, from area to area, and you'll come across different things because they're not all trying to imitate each other. They're doing local stuff. I could mention a Swiss tradition of tiny breweries swarming to festivals uh, and also setting up along well-known hiking trails and whatever. But I'll just finish by mentioning the thing that Elmer and Marjorie said to me because, okay, I gave them some leads about pubs, like the, the pub in Plymouth that's a converted telephone exchange. They loved that. Um, <laughs> and I always remember they said, I said, because you because you've also got the Plymouth Fathers there. And Marjorie said, oh, we may get time to go there. We may be not. They were interested in the telecom. Um, but in exchange for this, they gave me one insight into their travels. Uh, and this was the thing that made the difference. As they said, they were very pleased to be going around doing this phone box by phone box, old exchange by old exchange, old, old, old sub transatlantic cable by train. Because that way you got to meet real people in their ordinary places and not the places that the authorities wanted you to see. And I think I've got that out of beer traveling for the best part of 50 years. Uh, I think I've got to see the ordinary places where ordinary people go. Uh, and I know a lot more about the world because of it. Would I, and I, would I do it differently if I was doing it? Largely not, except for three things. Um, I'd avoid beer festivals that have lots of music and not many beers, because they tend to be a waste of time and money, in my experience. Um, I'd have learned about the interrail railway pass, or if you're from outside Europe, the U-rail rail pass, a lot sooner than I did, because you can travel mammoth distances in Europe at a remarkably low price. You can even afford first class quite easily, and that's a great way to get about. And the third thing, I'd have eaten more salads because it's not the beer that puts on the weight, it's the diet. And if I'd done more salads, I wouldn't be quite the size I am now. <laughs> thank you. I'm now happy to take all questions. Tim, Tim, thank you really very, very much for that. That's uh, enlightening. And I'm delighted to see that uh, you mentioned Traquair as your first of the beers, because I must admit, I had a wonderful experience many years ago of actually meeting Peter Maxwell Stewart, who was Laird. Uh, he was yeah. a lovely man. And the time he took to explain the brewing process and what it meant to him while shoving the ducks outside into the duck pond. Uh, and especially when he just went in, took a glass, scooped it straight across the top of the fermentation vessel and said, try that and tell me what you think of it. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, there's a couple of questions I did give you, Tim, and I, I just like your comments. If you were, I'm giving you the, the ability to travel in time and place. So where would you like to go? Where would I like to go that I haven't been? Or where would I like to go again? I don't mind. Okay. Um. I think well, there's, so, there's so many experiences. The One of the most bizarre beer experiences I've had, uh, well, the most bizarre was in Albania, where I discovered a microbrewery on the seventh floor of a block of flats. Um, and it seemed to be serving a really bad homebrew to people who stayed bed and breakfast. Um, th that was the most bizarre one. Uh, I'd like to go back to Svalbard because Svalbard has got a brewery on it. It's the northernmost inhabited island in the world. 
Uh, it's not only got the very good quality Norwegian uh, brewery there. Uh, there's also now not one, but I think two Russian breweries there are also on the same islands. Uh, so I'd like to go back there to see what those are like. Uh, best era, best... Uh, I think I'm mixing it up with my own personal experiences of it. Is It's got to be Belgium in the 1980s when... Uh, we were people like Michael Jackson and myself were scrabbling around to try and get more uh, publicity for Belgian beer because it was seriously going on. As late as 2004, when we did a book on Lambic, uh, we did the book on Lambic because Lambic was about to disappear, and so were the Lambic cafes. And this was 2004. This was only 20 years ago. Uh, and you you look what's happening with Lambic now. That's unbelievable that it was about to disappear. So just the discovering more and more existing stuff in Belgium and being able to bring that to people's attention was, uh, that was very special. All right, thanks. Thanks. There's a question on here from um, somebody called Henry Reuklin. I can't think of who the person is. A very um, familiar name. Yes. Uh, when did people start boiling the mush or wort and why, as far as you know? I don't know is the answer to that. Um, and I haven't seen anything convincing about whether that is what is thought to have happened way back in China, ancient Egypt, etc. cetera. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I, I do, uh, St. Arnold of Soissons, as opposed to the other St. Arnold, I think he was, um he was quite early i think he was 10th 11th century um and he he's the guy who was saying you should drink beer because it's been boiled and it's whatever whether that was full boil whether that was just heating to mashing temperature i, I honestly don't know i don't know i mean it's strange uh i certainly i remember coming across on one of our trip on one of our um ebcu meeting trips down in austria where somebody was saying that they their particular brewing history went back to round about the 12th century, I reckon, and their method always was heating up cubes of granite. Ah, uh, stone brewing, yes, yeah, stone brewing. Stone brewing. Mm -hmm. uh, well, yes, you're another way. I'd love to go to Faroe Islands on the one or two days a year where they heat up molten, well, they heat up lava rocks to about 800, 900 degrees, 900 degrees, and then they drop them into the mesh. Um, I'd like to see that. Uh, I've seen pictures of it, I've seen photographs of it, but I'd like to be there and do that. I'm talking, it gets this incredible, incredible caramel mm, yeah. layer uh, and effect of it. All right. And my last one to you was a word of advice to our big brewers these days, apart from please close and go away. <laughs> <laughs> um, <clears throat> well, I, I've, I've been around the block quite a lot. And I, I do get everywhere. I do meet all sorts of people all all over the world. And and I got the sort of brain that condenses things down eventually and try and sees patterns. And the pattern I'm seeing at the moment is I don't think the large brewers or the medium-sized regional brewers or the small brewers or the craft brewers really know what they're doing at the moment. Um I think with the large brewers. They're falling back on the banking rules. They're very good at being big businesses and they think that's going to see them through. They're not looking at what's happening to the, particularly to the sort of uniform products that they, they deal in, um, are going out of fashion. Beer, it, it, it may be worse in the UK than elsewhere, but in the UK, the UK is rapidly becoming a nation of, of wine drinkers. Uh, when I started in the, in the, in, in the campaign for real ale, 40 years ago, two thirds of the alcohol drunk in Britain was beer. Today, it's one third. They've lost half of their hold in the alcoholic beverage market. And I see this happening in all countries that they are losing market share. Um, and rather than do anything about it, they just think they have to be a more efficient bank um, and apply rules that get them by as a large business. They're not looking at what people want. And I think the migration to wine in the in the beer states um, it's because wine tastes better on average um 
And the same with cocktails, which is the other thing that's happening at the moment. Bigger taste. Why are they not looking at this and thinking, there's a bigger tastes? That's that that's what craft brewing brought. That's what reversed the trend away from beer losing market share for a good 15 years up until COVID messing everything about. Um, that to me is the obvious message for a brewer of any side. Make beers with good tastes, big tastes. Okay, Tim. Uh getting a lot of comments, but uh, mainly people talking about where to go to uh, mm. that they know of in Britain, in Belgium and round there. What a surprise. <laughs> um, I think the thing as well is that Bruins brought out traditions and history. We have the uh, the Ale Connors. We have the, as you mentioned, uh, the Brewsters being part of the history. Yeah. There was the, um, was it the broom that was hung out to it for a sign of uh, a new brew? That's what, that's, yes. I'm, I don't do historical research. I'm really pleased when people like Martin Cornell and Ron Pattinson and many others do do the hard digging and then present the not just the facts, but how they've interpreted the facts and why they've interpreted them that way. It's fantastic. Um, the and, and I'm always a bit skeptical about bits of history because the brewing industry in particular is very good at taking nice sounding bits of history and making them the truth uh, when they're not always so. Um, but I, I and, and the other thing is beer has always right from Roman times there's good documentation in Roman times that beer was the drink of the soldiers and the laborers um, and that the the educated classes and the decision makers all drank wine um, now that's off, that's often been the case all over Europe and and folk history for the soldiers and the laborers doesn't get written very often so the materials we've got I think are, are are not necessarily the best. But I do think you can see patterns across centuries, across different uh, cultures uh, that are fairly consistent. And from that, you can, I think you take some interesting historical uh, wild guesses. Tim, uh... Uh, that doesn't people seem to have I, I think they're slightly shell-shocked you've said so much you've given them so much to think on uh <laughs> you far exceeded what i hope for this for the starter uh i look forward as you said yes uh john duffy's going to do uh ireland uh, i think it's september and we're going to have uh, iceland in november iceland promises to be very interesting because it's such a new and unique yeah. Place and it's only really come to knowledge. Uh, I think what you've mentioned is right as well. You've talked of the uh, the growth of beer culture in uh, Iberia, down Spain and Portugal. It's it's blooming down there like mad. What happened in, in Italy with the explosion of beer styles and uh, having known the uh, knowing the people in uh, Mobi and in Ibirai. They they weren't afraid to brew anything in any style. I th I think that's right. It it, it is um, <clears throat> if you're in a culture where you've got brewing traditions, um, and we in the UK, I think we're in the worst possible position because we're trying desperately to save cask ale with with some minimal success at the moment. Um, but we've also got this past history from the 19th century of creating some of the world's great beer styles. Um, so the uh experimentation to do something really new well i'm not sure it's entirely necessary i think we can just go back to producing really good quality 19th century style beer styles and and, and that would advance things if only we didn't have to pay so much tax on them um if you're in a country like though spain's a very good example because spain's always been a high beer consumption country but it hasn't had its uh its own beer styles and it means that when you start getting a lot of inventive brewers coming along they may well come up with something that is not, um, it's not constrained by, oh, that's not very Spanish, is it? Uh, it's not constrained. They can do anything. And if they come up with something that works for their region, they've suddenly got a, uh, they've got a Spanish beer style. And that's, that's an advantage to have that. So they can be more inventive. Though I have to say, one of my memories, one of my great memories of beer traveling was to be in Barcelona 
uh, or what I would, as an Englishman, would say was high summer, but they seem to think was late spring. Um, and it was boiling bloody hot. And 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 I am presented with a 75 centilitre bottle of 12.5% imperial stout, iced. <laughs> and they said, oh, it really works. And there is this imperial stout coming out into the glass at probably about four degrees. And I'm thinking, oh, gosh, that stings. Um, and then, and, and and they said, but we do it with Rioja. So why shouldn't we do it with, 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 with what's essentially, a, well, a wine strength beer? Um, and it did work. It was whatever. Yeah. Uh, Terry, you mentioned the, um, the, the ones coming up for 2024. Absolutely correct. Uh, we also extend the program into 2025. Uh, in January, we've got Poland um, coming up and later on the year, we should have Finland as well. And I will just do another plug for the um, uh, All About Beer series. So uh, we've got Green Hot Beer in June. Uh, I've already mentioned beer and chocolate. We've got uh, Berliner Weiss in October. Um and December should be an interesting one. We're having contributions from across Europe and we want people to think about a little presentation on your Christmas beers. So if you've got a Christmas beer in your country that you'd like to sort of just highlight, um, that's the opportunity to do it. Thanks, Terry. Over to you. Yeah, thanks, Brett. Thank but first of all, Tim, thank you very, very much for this. Uh, I might even have to buy you a pint in two weeks' time. I'm not guaranteeing it, you see. <laughs> I'm going back to being an Abedonian now. Okay. Um, but yes, up in uh, see you in Dundee. But thank you, Tim. Um, I think the one thing that comes out of this is that one of the best places and one of the most enjoyable places to enjoy the beers is the cafe, the bar, even perhaps a little street stall that's selling it. But with people around you who are locals and who are there, and you'll find usually are very friendly, willing to chat, willing to talk to you and share that love of why they're there in a place called the pub, the bar, the cafe, whatsoever. Something we, if we lose, then the world will be a very sadder place. So I don't want to leave you on that. I want to leave you on the thought that it's going to be a better place because we're not going to lose them. So thanks, Terry. Thanks, Tim. Thanks, okay. Brett.